tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. <laughs> Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's program, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with audio adaptations of two rounds of frightening fiction about gruesome games and perilous plumbing. I'm Jason Hill, host of the Horror Hill Podcast, now in its second season, and available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else podcasts can be found. We'll be filling in tonight for my good friend Steve Taylor while he's... <laughs> indisposed. But don't worry, Steve will be back before you know it. In the meantime, join me as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your wildest imaginations. Joining us tonight to help bring our frightening fiction to life are yours truly, Jason Hill, and Evil Idol 2019 voice acting competition frontrunner Eric Peabody. You can check out Eric's entries and those from the other 49 candidates in this year's competition on our official YouTube channel, or at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com slash Evil Idol 2019. Thanks for your support of this program and this year's candidates. Now, get your ticket ready. Take your seat in our theater of the minds. Then brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first tale tonight is written by author Luciano Morano and is voiced by yours truly, Jason Hill. In it, we'll visit a bowling alley, which is about to play host to a sporting rivalry where there's more than pride and a trophy at stake. In fact, it may even be a matter of life and death. <laughs> Without further ado, I present to you Strike from the gutter. The hearse told Richie everything he needed to know. There were a few other cars huddled up front in the lot outside the bowling alley, but the midnight black funeral car stood alone, a patch of persistent wheeled shadow. Beneath the harsh glare of sickly orange sodium vapor lights, the Count was here already. Trekking across the lot, favoring his good knee, Richie's Birkenstock shot feet avoided broken glass and slimy puddles even as his eyes remained fixed on the entrance. It had been a long time, and a lot of miles. Thousands of pins knocked down in hundreds of alleys since Pittsburgh, but his resolve had not flagged. Part of him had always known it would end like this, one way or another, on the lanes. He just never figured it would end in New Jersey. The sliding glass doors leapt aside as if by telekinetic command as Richie Santoro entered the alley, his natural habitat, like a gunfighter, swaggering into an Old West saloon. He eyed the large banner draped across the dusty vending machines. 2018 National Solo Championship. His grip tightened reflexively on the bag's handle as he approached the counter. The clattering of pins, 
a strike. His expert ears deciphered, a graceful straight-up-the-middle shot, echoed from somewhere near the back of the vast, fluorescent-soaked chamber. The woman, a mound of flesh in a green moo perched on a stool behind the cash register, leisurely looked up. Richie watched from behind his tinted aviators, once affectation, now prescription, as her sleepy focus went from the name stenciled on his shirt to his beard, finishing at last at his trademark straw fedora. The tiniest spark of interest flared somewhere in the bloodshot eyes beneath her blue-gray wig. You're him, she whispered. You're the Slayer. He nodded. The woman's slitted eyes shifted to the far end of the lanes. He's over there. Been here since sundown. Elaine, please, Richie said. He's on 24. The smile spread over her face like a rash. You maybe want... No. Near the front, please. Lane 4. He passed over some wrinkled bills, more than necessary. She nodded, curiosity already fading. As he turned, the ogress called. Hey, you need shoes? Richie didn't bother to answer. Collapsing onto the lane bench, he unfastened his sandals, unzipped his bag. Eyeing the familiar, imperious congregation of pins, Richie began the routine. Changing shoes, donning his wrist protector. Another crash rang out from the rear of the alley. Another strike. Richie watched three teenage boys at lane eight, goofing around more than bowling. He saw the janitor wheeling his squeaky cart into the bathroom. He could also make out, through his peripheral vision, a familiar figure, tall and dark, standing imperiously on the far lane. Eyes back on the bag, Richie unwrapped his ball. Custom mother of pearl. Slick and smooth as still water. Sixteen pounds. The chocolate brown iris around an inky pupil painted below the finger holes completed the icon. An enormous eyeball. The eye of God. He stood and found the count suddenly before him, as if he had always been there leaning casually against the ball return. I thought perhaps you would not show. The Count's accent was inexplicable, Bond villain by way of a stray cat cover band. He stood impossibly still, not blinking, not breathing, thin as a late-stage AIDS patient in his usual black suit and cape, shoes so shiny they seemed to glow. Richie cradled his ball, staring back with all three eyes, unafraid, resigned. A bet's a bet. Yes, the Count ran a hand through his long, dark hair. A bet is a bet. And you are a fool. He smiled, points of his sharpened eye teeth slightly stabbing his lower lip. His complexion was the sallow blue of a recently drowned man, but then again, everybody looked undead beneath alley lights. Teeth aside, you had to look him in the eye to really notice there was something wrong. The Count's eyes were too reflective, contained no life. Windows, looking in on an empty room. Why do you not fight me like a man? The Count said. Your father and grandfather, at least they died as men. What kind of a man are you? The kind who's going to beat you tomorrow. The Count growled. You insult me and shame your ancestors. Why do you insist in this? You are old, injured. Why keep playing? Because I'm the best, Richie said. Because I know this is the only thing that brings you any joy. And I prepare to die, ruining it for you. In a blink, the Count crossed the distance between them and stood nose to nose with Richie. He reeked of spoiled meat and overripe fruit. You certainly will die, he hissed. Go home, Slayer, while you still can. Something warm and sticky struck Richie's back. 
He saw the Count's grin widen and began to turn, just in time to be hit in the chest by another cheese-lathered french fry and face the collective glare of the Count's wives. The beguiling trio giggled, standing on the carpet just off the wood of the lanes in stiletto heels and leather tights. They wore matching black tank tops despite the chill of the A.C., pale skin practically luminescent beneath their garish red lips and lush violet eye makeup. Moron, said Lilith, tall and blonde, stabbing a third fry with one long crimson nail. Sucker, said Pandora, lithe, with short spiky hair, closing her lips around the straw of a large soda. Loser, said Layla, short and voluptuous with long red hair, tapping his cigarette out of the pack. Ladies, Richie nodded, bending to return his ball to the bag. It was no use. He knew they'd never let him focus tonight. The Count's beloved mind games were already in full swing. Richie felt the vampire looming over him, the predatory stare piercing his back. He did not hurry, though. Rising at last and slowly strolling away, as if he never intended to do any bowling. You do not wish to practice, the Count laughed. <laughs> you are so good already, yes? Eyes again fixed on the door, Richie was followed outside by the wife's chorus of cackling as, through the alley's crackling sound system, Eddie Money bragged about his pair of tickets to paradise. After four costly mini-bar beers and too many hours of shrieking infomercials, Richie at last captured sleep just before three in the morning. He was roused promptly at six by a wake-up call he certainly did not request. Uh, your wife did, sir, the clerk said. She was uh, quite insistent. Tall, blonde, long red nails. Um, yes. Thanks. Richie hung up. More psychological warfare from the primo psycho in his life. The Count must really be scared this time. That was gratifying. And also very dangerous. The end was in sight at last. But Richie had come this close before. And look what happened. Thinking about Pittsburgh made all his old wounds flare up. Knee grating in protest, Richie hefted himself from bed in pursuit of breakfast. Diners adjacent to 24-7 bowling alley serve anything on the menu at any time of day. It's practically a law. Still, even the obviously salty pro who took Richie's order looked askance when he ordered the supreme nacho platter at 7 a.m. The haggard woman managed a slight, genuine smile as she watched him attack it. Mr. Santoro. The voice was clipped and professional, blasting through the fog of his feeding frenzy like a well-thrown strike through kindling wood, what pros call the wobbliest of pins. May I ask you a few questions? The woman was young and pretty, wearing dark pants and a denim shirt, carrying a notebook and a little voice recorder. My name's Leia. I'm with the American Bowling Journal. She slid into the booth. Is it true this is your last tournament? Through a mouth of mostly masticated chips and cheese, Richie said. No comment. Is it true you have some sort of secret side bet going with the Count? Richie wiped cheese from his beard with the back of his hand. Is he a real vampire? Leia sat with pen poised, little red light on her recorder blazing up from the table, waiting for him to scoff, intended icebreaker failing to make a dent. Go ask him. Richie reached for his coffee. He doesn't do interviews. His managers, those creepy ladies, they won't let anyone near him. Richie slurped, eyeing the girl. Being young and attractive, her ambition was still comely. Richie knew the neighborhood that particular life road led to, though. Hell, he lived there. It would get ugly. So would she. He'll talk if he sees you. Just don't be alone with him. Anyone ever tell you you're too pretty to work for a bowling magazine? Her narrowed eyes indicated she'd heard and did not appreciate his commentary though her smile and posture remained professional. Richie saw hunger royal beneath her composure, 
knew a predator when he saw one. I'm actually just an intern, Leah said, but I want to be a real sports reporter someday. You could really help me out, you know. Just a few thoughts? Richie picked at his nachos. About what? If you win tonight, it'll be your fifth straight solo title. That's historic. How does it feel? Huh. No comment. Okay, she swallowed, glancing down at her notes, deciding something. How about this, then? Why didn't you quit the game after your wife died? Staring into the abyss of molten cheese, Richie said, Why stop? She died in a car accident. She fell asleep at the wheel, Leah said. That's what they say. She was exhausted driving you across three states from one tournament to be at another the very next day. Hmm. They lie, Richie said. We were run off the road. Why do you hate the Count? I hate all my opponents. You have to in order to win. Is there a secret bet between you two? Yes. What do you get if you win? He quits bowling. Forever. And if you lose, what happens? Nothing. Richie stood, wiped his hands on his pants. That's the problem. Back across the highway in his beige cell of a room, the latest in a lifelong series of identical temporary residences, Richie took a long hot shower to loosen his stiff muscles and ease his joints. Hands moving slowly over the puffy veins of scar tissue spiderwebbing his flesh, he forced himself not to think about that night. She fell asleep at the wheel. That's what they say. Richie turned his face up to the hot spray. Is he a real vampire? His mind filled with fangs and pouty lips. Lips redder than his own flushed skin beneath the scalding downpour. Fangs whiter than pins, begging him to knock them down. She was exhausted, driving you across three states from one tournament to be at another the very next day. Richie saw his grandfather, his father too, both lying dead in lonely, shabby hotel rooms just like this one, their throats torn out. As he stepped dripping from the shower into the misty sauna of the bathroom, Richie also saw that somebody had drawn on the condensation-covered mirror just one word, a name with a line through it. Hannah. Why didn't you quit the game after your wife died? Sweet Jesus, Richie thought. When was the last time it had felt like a game? There are rules to this, like any sport. The crucifix and sunlight situation? That's true. So is the thing about running water. They can't cross it. The invitation myth is nonsense, as is the garlic and the whole grave dirt bit. They cast no reflection, that's true, and blood. They do drink it. They're very fast and very strong, but not immune to harm if you get the drop on them or find them in the daytime. These are things all young slayers are taught, as simple and essential as A, B, C, and 1, 2, 3. Richie's grandfather had been an academic slayer, a professor of medicine, a learned man. His father had been a man of action, a leather trench coat wearing desperado with more weapons than wits. Neither had been up to the task of besting the count. Richie recalled a childhood of cheap motels and truck stops, dive bars and bowling alleys, always in the back seat as his father and grandfather chased their favorite monster, tracking him body by body, one victim at a time. Not that he was hard to find, sooner or later the Count always turned up on the circuit at a tournament or in a night league, because that's the other thing the legends got right. They love games, puzzles, riddles, gambling, the need to count and organize, these are all bone-deep instincts in the Nosferatu, and the Count loved bowling best of all. 
The original version of the game dates back to ancient Egypt, possibly earlier. Nobody knows for sure, but some variation has been played by almost every society around the world since. Maybe it reminded the vampire of better days, Richie thought. It did him, that was for sure. After years of killing time in alleys while his grandfather and father searched and spied, while they tracked their quarry from one nowhere burg to the next, Richie had found he was pretty damn good on the lanes. In fact, he was a natural. As he got older, and the men felt okay about leaving him alone with a pocket full of cash to play while they were hunting, he got better. He won tournaments. He hustled. Eventually, he went pro. Richie had no interest in being a slayer, no desire to protect anyone. The world's an ugly place, and he was content to make his own humble way in it, one frame at a time. He liked the bars and the girls, snagged sponsorships and won titles. He lost years of his life to a selfish, hazy fugue of strikes, spares, and one-night stands. His father was devastated. They stopped speaking. Richie saw the count occasionally. The circuit's not so big they could avoid each other forever. It didn't matter, though, because that's the other rule all young slayers are taught. The bystander clause. The non-combative progeny of a slayer is off-limits. There are no exceptions. He and the count circled each other like mean dogs in a small yard for years, forced to tolerate one another's presence until Richie's father was killed. He'd come to ask Richie for help, to beg him for help, one last time after Gramps had bought it. But Richie wanted no part of the family business back in the day, and he still had not. He cared nothing for most people. So why stick your neck out, pun absolutely intended, for them? But his father just couldn't let it go after, no matter how many times the Count warned him off. It was only a matter of time. Afterward, Richie was racked with guilt, thought of seeking revenge, felt his slayer genes whispering. But by then he had more than just himself to think about. There was Hannah, and she was everything. God, how he loved her. Hannah was an artist. She painted, was especially good at the glow-in-the-dark motifs that decorated so many alley walls. Cyberbowling, they used to call it. Richie remembered rolling the ball under black lights, music blaring and Hannah's psychedelic designs leaping off the walls back in better times. She painted hot rods and motorcycles, Frank Frazetta-type van murals, local theater sets, anything that paid. She'd even painted the hand of God for him. There is no bystander clause protecting the wife of a slayer's son. He would not risk Hannah becoming involved in his family's cursed crusade. So, Richie had been forced to find another way to avenge his old man. He was an athlete, not a killer. So, he'd formulated an athlete's plan. Richie knew what it was to love the game, knew what it was for a man to take refuge in something difficult done well. He approached the Count with a wager, knowing full well no undead could resist such a gamble. The first of five consecutive championships wins. Loser. Quits. Forever. Then... On the eve of his fifth victory, there was the car crash outside Pittsburgh. Hannah's death. It had been a stupid thing to do, playing a corporate tourney so far away the night before the title match. But it had been easy money, and they badly needed it. Hannah had offered to drive so he could rest. When Richie came to, the car was in a ditch. His wife was dead and the fading taillights of a familiar hearse were disappearing into the night. Two years of recovery had followed. Rehab and frustration, years more spent watching the monster swagger through the competition. Win one, lose two, lose three, win one. Richie had struggled to find his rhythm again, to get back in the groove of the game. The temptation to attack had been maddening, 
the desire for revenge like a fever scorching his brain. But Richie stayed focused, knowing always his ace in the hole. His greatest advantage remained intact. The bystander claws. The Count once had four wives. A skinny brunette with mean green eyes had disappeared shortly after the crash. Richie thought he had a pretty good idea who was driving the hearse that night. An eager young wife, hoping to please her dark master, looking to score a special place in his heart, perhaps. Was she ignorant of the age-old rules, or simply willing to disregard them? Or maybe the Count made her do it. A necessary sacrifice for the chance to take out Richie. What else might he be willing to do, Richie wondered, if the Count was that desperate again. Because now, finally, Richie was once more on the eve of victory. He'd come close many times, but not this close. Not since Pittsburgh. It had been a torturous road. Years of lonely struggle with each win seeming nearly impossible. But he'd done it. But he was not what he once was, and Richie knew he did not have five more in him. It was now, or never. All this he told Leia in the alley bar as the sun set outside and he enacted his pre-tournament ritual. Athletes are a superstitious lot. Before a match, Richie always ate three hot dogs with mustard and relish and drank exactly six draft beers. The girl knew a lot for an intern had been waiting for him in the bar with the first round ordered. When he told her the whole story, because what did he have to lose at this point? She paid his bill and left, a look of concerned uncertainty on her face. She was clearly used to being lied to by men in bars, but his motive, his endgame, confused her. She didn't want to miss a story, but she couldn't afford to be a fool. Richie found he didn't care either way. It was a relief, feeling the professional side of his brain stepping up, taking over. Now was not the time for feelings or doubt. Now was the time to roll, time to hit the lane and do what he did best, and let the pins scatter as they may. He hadn't asked to be born into this craziness, but he was too close to the end to be distracted by a cute reporter's disbelief. Once, the circuit had been full of cute girls, big money, drugs, and high times, but things were very different now. Fewer and fewer alleys dotted the map, money was scarce, and fewer people cared. That was okay with Richie, though. There was only one prize he still desired. A cold prickling on his neck announced what the bar mirror did not show. The Count's fetid breath filled his ears. There is time yet to leave, Slayer. Time enough for a new life. A new love. Go and live while I still let you. Richie drained his beer, waved the glass at the bartender, ready for number six. It was almost time. In the adjacent alley, the collective murmur of the gathered crowd grew louder. They listened to it together for a time. Man and monster both living on well past their prime. They'd known much better crowds, but perhaps never higher stakes. The noise settled over them like the dust of bygone glory days that lingered in the corners of the alley, residue of better times. When the Count spoke again, his voice was edged with an incredible weariness which he'd never heard before. I played this game in the shadows of the newborn pyramids. He said. With living gods and gladiators I played. I have seen nations rise and fall, champions born and die. I have outlived stars, Slayer. Richie slipped his final pre match beer. If you played as well as you brag, maybe I'd be the one nervous right now. The Count's grip tightened on his neck cold as half a lifetime of lonesome nights. Nervous? I have killed thousands, Slayer. Do you hear me? I fear nothing. 
Uh, bull. Richie belched. You're a very old man. Afraid of the future. You're afraid of me. Afraid of change. Afraid of everything that you can't murder. Frigid lips brushed Richie's ear as the Count whispered. The old woman died in the mud like a dog. Your father wept like a child. One punch, that's all it would take. One punch, Richie knew. Good though it might feel, and he'd be fair game. Ancient privilege revoked forever. He listened as, to the speakers above the bar, Tommy Two-Tone sang about loving a girl he'd never met. Richie winked at his seemingly lonely reflection, reached again for his glass. Don't worry, he said. I won't. Diminished though it was from days of yore, the heavily clustered crowd at the 2018 National Solo Championship could still get loud. Cheers, wails, and thunderous applause filled the alley as the players worked through the initial matches on the bracket. There were a few true greats on the lanes. The best still in the game had come to the Garden State for one night to be someplace where things still made sense. But it was Richie and the Count who attracted the largest audience. It was them the people had come to see, the culmination of the what many said was the sport's all-time greatest rivalry. Richie rolled the eye of God straight and true with easy grace. The Count attacked the pins with his blood-red 25-pounder, specially made and, according to the legends, painted with the vital fluids of his victims. Rivals bested, opponents vanquished. It was ultimately Richie, the Slayer Santoro, and the Count, who met on the center lane to play ten frames that would decide it all. Even more so than the crowd or judges knew. Straight strikes kept things even through the seventh frame. An agonizing stalemate as the frothing spectators wrung their hands and shrieked with each new resounding crash of falling pins. Richie's knee was by then an insistent banshee, every muscle in his body threatening to give out. Sweat followed from his flesh like beer at a bachelor party, soaked his shirt, drenched the crotch of his pants. The Count was pristine as always. He strutted and waved to the crowd, cavorted and struck lewd poses with his wives for the jostling photographers. You're looking tired, Slayer he said, returning to the bench after his latest strike, words drowned out by the riotous frenzy of fandom behind them. Do you suffer? Please, spare me no details. Richie eyed the hissing trio of black-clad sirens and tipped his hat. Tell Lilith the next time she wanders in while I'm in the shower. She's free to join me. I'll show her what a man with a pulse can do. I bet she's forgotten. The Count's eyes flashed like a switchblade under a street lamp. He clenched his bony hands into shaking fists. Richie saw a gamble paying off. He bowled to the eighth with perfect strikes. Outwardly, he smiled and waved. But inside, his nerves were afire with raging pain. His knee felt like the cartilage had been replaced with broken glass. He saw the Count's form was off as the well-dressed ghoul stepped to the line in the ninth frame. He was too stiff, feet too far apart. His follow-through was too short. His return clipped. What distracted him was anyone's guess. But as he stalked back to the bench, his narrowed gaze did not leave his tall blonde concubine. Had he not known of her mirror message mission? As the ball struck just left of center, the clattering pins fell messily and the number seven remained upright. The Count snatched up a ball at random and threw it, not rolled, not cast, but hurled it like a baseball to fell the defiant pin and snag the spare. The crowd's joy was deafening. Victory was in sight, Richie knew. 
but it would take nothing less than his bowling a perfect game. The Count would not falter again. Perfect games are scarcer than people think, even among the pros. Rarely is there a night in which you make absolutely no mistakes on or off the lanes. He bowled again, pain ripping through his body like a razor-wielding Tasmanian devil. As he released the ball, Richie collapsed to one knee and the cheering of this, his luckiest of strikes, shifted quickly to sounds of confusion. He struggled to his feet, waving off the approaching league doctor, and limped back to the bench. The match thus entered the final frame with the count behind, but Richie far from confident. Grinning, the count stood and quickly bowled a strike. He repeated the action identically, closing the points gap further. Then, with a grand wave to the now hushed crowd, he did it again. A strike louder and more decisive than ever, as if to blast away the memory of his previous misstep. But he could not erase the score. Richie forced his bleary eyes to focus on the pins. If he could bowl three strikes now, he could win. Anything less would be utter defeat, no matter what the board showed. He bowled, seeing nothing but the pins, thinking of nothing, but simply feeling the way his muscles moved the familiar sensation of a good roll. The light shimmered on the flawless wood of the lane like heat rising from a noontime highway. Ten pins fell. Cheers. Applause. The Count sulked on the bench. He bowled, and the pain was like an external force now. Something beside himself, and annoying distraction Richie's well-trained athlete brain tuned out. Ten pins fell, louder cheers, more vigorous applause. The Count grabbed a nearby blue twelve-pounder and squeezed with both hands. It cracked, then exploded, shattering into pieces and dust. The crowd fell silent. The lead official, the male version of the moo-moo-wearing hag behind the counter, wearing a Hawaiian shirt, came hustling over to cite the Count for unsportsmanlike behavior, but scurried away when faced with a vampire's glare. Was the chubby guy the ogress's brother? Richie wondered. Her husband? His exhausted brain fumbled stupidly with the thought, could not decide which scenario was more horrifying. Time seemed to slow as Richie massaged his knee, held his hands over the blasting air of the dryer, watched as the janitor quickly and silently swept away the remains of the destroyed ball. Everything happened soundlessly, like he was underwater. Then, the volume returned as he finally stepped back to the line, eye of God in hand. The crowd roared. The Count's wives called to Richie, taunting. He paid them all no heed, eyed the pins his whole world reduced to length of the lane. He bowled. The ball struck the boards just right and practically floated down the lane. The pins fell away like the years and miles of Richie's life, and he was again a lonely boy, discovering this thing, his thing, that made him feel so good. The pins clattered together, falling away like Richie's regrets and his guilt. He was once again young and in love, certain of his place in the world. No pins remained standing. Richie turned to face the cacophonous crowd, all cameras flashing and hands waving, and saw the Count and his wives were also gone, as vanished as the fallen pins, as absent as if they'd never been there at all. Beneath the harsh lights of the loading dock behind the alley, the Count strode forward like a living slice of blackness. It was chilly, but his tone was even colder. Why should I not disregard this foolishness and carry on as I wish? Richie shrugged. A bet's a bet. The Count laughed, a strangely hearty, vibrant exultation that echoed in the dark. 
Yes. A bet is still a bet. And you are still a fool. I am eternal. You have won nothing. Richie reached out and yanked the blood-red ball from the Count's skeletal hands. Maybe. But you've bowled your last frame. The Count's window eyes seemed to shatter like they just kissed a well-thrown brick as he stared unbelieving at his ball in Richie's hands. It's nothing, he muttered. <laughs> just a game. A trifle. Silence hung long and heavy between them, the unquiet quiet shared only by warriors in the wake of battle. It made me feel something, the Count said, eyes on the ball. Something I've forgotten, I think. Something like being alive. I know, Richie hefted the ball into the nearby dumpster. That's what love does. Now, you know what it feels like to have it taken away. How I feel every day. Now you get to live with it for as long as you can. The Count flashed his fangs. Someday, Slayer, when you are old and sick, I will come to you. Stand over your bed, untouched by time, and you will beg me to end your suffering, and I will laugh in your face. Richie said, Tomorrow is supposed to be beautiful. Why don't you stay up late with me and watch it arrive? The Count roared, the tormented cry of all doomed things, of caged creatures the world over, the howling madness of eternity itself, and disappeared into the night with a flap of his cape. Richie reached down to the bag between his feet, picked up the Eye of God, and threw it into the dumpster. Inside the alley, he heard Ann Wilson singing about carnivorous fish and... Above that, the growing chant, Slayer, Slayer, Slayer. He could go to them, Richie knew. He could revel in their glorification and wait out the dark. He could gather around the flickering fire of a trophy and title with the last of the faithful and squeeze a few more precious moments out of this thing that had once been his whole world. Instead, he limped away from the neon haven of the lanes toward the shadowy uncertainty of tomorrow. He had not always been so wise, had cast his early role sloppily, seeing only the pins and missing the point. But bowling, like life, is as much about what you will do as it is what you have done. The next frame is just as important as the last, maybe even more so. Richie thought he was working from a pretty crucial strike after tonight, and intended not to waste his advantage. Mind full of ghouls and girls and glory days, he went off to pick up the spare, to face the seven-tenths split of his life, however much of it remained. I hope you enjoyed Strike from the Gutter, as written by Luciano Morano and performed by yours truly, Jason Hill. If you enjoyed what you've heard, please do me a favor and check out the Horror Hill podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And subscribe to me to make sure you never miss a new episode. Or... Find me at simplyscarypodcast.com slash shows. Horror Hill is now in its second season, and every one of my episodes features several terrifying hand-picked tales, 
guaranteed to give you nightmares. I promise you won't be disappointed. Up next, we've got one final tale for you, written by Chris Mueller and brought to life by voice actor Eric Peabody. In it, we'll meet a gentleman in charge of maintaining industrial machinery during the graveyard shift, and the job is as boring as it sounds. That is, until one night, when he discovers that he's not alone, and that his nighttime visitor may not be human. Without further ado, I present to you the problem with the drains. Man, that shift sucks. I hear it all the time. I can understand why people say it. I used to think the same thing. I still do some days. I'm one of the lucky people that get to go to work while everybody else is sleeping soundly in their nice warm bed. It does have its perks, though. Most importantly for me, I'm all by myself, all night long. No bosses breathing down my neck, no co-workers getting on my nerves. Truth is, I just don't play very well with others. Never have. It's how I landed here on the midnight shift in the first place. I was getting under everybody's skin during the day and I'd had my fill of them as well. I'd ruffled too many feathers as I often do. They probably would have just canned me altogether except for the fact that I'm damn good at my job, so they just changed my shift instead. All's well that ends well, and if I'm being completely honest, I was happy they did it. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's far from perfect. Sleeping during the day can be problematic. The rest of the world doesn't give a damn that you're trying to get some shut-eye. Kids play and dogs bark, salesmen knock and sirens scream. All things considered, though, everything was actually going really smoothly until the problem with the drains started. You see, I'm an overnight engineer in an office building. It's not a huge building, not a skyscraper or anything like that, but big enough to need a mechanic to babysit it all night. There's a whole mess of systems running 24-7 in a big building to keep everything ticking the way it's supposed to. Electric, HVAC, plumbing, all the things office workers take for granted. I keep their computer servers cool and their air clean and breathable. Nice and warm at your desk on a 10 degree day in February? Thank a building engineer. Did you ever see The Wizard of Oz? Guys like me are the man behind the curtain. Like I already said, I'm quite good at it and for the most part, everything ran smoothly the way it was supposed to. But then there were the drains. It all started a couple of weeks after I began working the graveyard shift. I was making my rounds, checking the boilers and water pumps when I noticed a strange smell and a pool of water around one of the circular floor drains in the boiler room. Plumbing clogs weren't all that unusual in a large building, especially when it came to the toilets. You can't imagine what people try to flush down those things. But a clogged floor drain was unusual. They're really only there to help with damage control in the event of a flood if a boiler or a pump were to let go. To see one backed up was weird. Maybe one of the daytime guys swept the floor, didn't feel like going to find a dustpan, and swept a bunch of crap down there. When it came right down to it, the how and the why didn't matter. What did matter was that it was my problem at that point, and it needed to be fixed. So I got to work taking care of it like I had a hundred times before on a hundred other clogged drains. I tried a plunger first, looking for the quick, easy fix, but that didn't do the trick. Grabbed a short manual auger to try to clear the trap out. The trap, in case you don't know, is the bend below a drain that stays filled with water all the time. The water in the trap forms a liquid seal and it's the reason you don't smell an entire city's sewer system every time you walk past a sink or toilet. It's also very prone to catching things and causing clogs. The auger didn't work either, which meant the problem was even deeper than that. It was time to break out the big guns. I went down to my shop and retrieved the end-all be-all of drain clearing tools. A heavy-duty, 200-foot-long motorized snake enough length and power to tackle even the nastiest blockages. It had an auger head attached, which could push through whatever was causing the trouble and get the water flowing again. I set it up next to the drain, pulled my gloves on, and got to work. 
I fed about ten feet in by hand and then got the snake spinning with the foot pedal switch. The electric motor simultaneously spun the snake and slowly fed it into the pipe. I was surprised to see how deep the clog actually was. I watched the length markers appear on the metal snake from within the drum and then disappear again as they spun down into the drain. 20 feet, 40, 60, 80, all the way to 160 feet. I was starting to worry that I'd run out of snake before I reached the obstruction when I felt it hit something. The motor labored slightly as the auger pushed into the clog. Then something strange happened. It seemed as though the snake got pulled out a bit, like when a fish on a hook swims away and takes some of your fishing line with it. I didn't think much of it and was relieved to see the pooled up water receding into the drain. Mission accomplished. I reversed the direction of the motor and began feeding the snake back into the drum, wiping it dry as I went. When I got to the 20 foot marker, I remembered hearing a strange noise that almost seemed to come from the drain itself. It sounded like a faint screech, but not the metal on metal scraping that rang out as the snake spun inside a cast iron drain pipe. It sounded almost uh, like an animal crying out. I should take a minute to make something clear. Spending many hours alone in a huge building at night can have some nasty side effects. Combined with the inherent lack of sleep that came with overnight work, solitude can sometimes make you think you heard or saw something that wasn't really there. I was ready to dismiss the sound until I saw what was on the head of the metal snake as the last five feet emerged from the dark drain. There was a strand of what looked like dark grayish rubber hung up onto the auger. There was also some slimy pinkish matter around it, and I couldn't for the life of me imagine what it was that I had just spun the snake into. I didn't think much more of it as I wiped the snake clean and started mopping up around the drain. After that, the rest of the night played out like any other and I went home as soon as my relief arrived. I had some trouble sleeping the night and had what I can only describe as a general feeling of unease that I couldn't quite put my finger on. After tossing and turning for most of the afternoon, sleep finally did take me. I only got about three hours worth, however, before I heard the alarm buzzing to signal the start of a new workday. I didn't get along with any of the daytime engineers and we rarely spoke. Instead, I always learned of the day's events by reading the logbook that we kept in our control room. On that particular day, I saw that a different train had backed up in the basement. Much like the night before, they had needed the big snake to clear it. This didn't surprise me too much. Sometimes when you cleared a blockage, it would get itself stuck further down the line and you'd end up with another clog shortly after. I assumed that's what had happened. On the bright side, the basement was the last stop on the way to the sewer, so if they cleared the blockage down there, I figured that it would be gone for good. Unfortunately, I'd soon learn otherwise. At around 4 a.m., I was sitting at a bench in the boiler room looking through some maintenance records when I heard a light slapping sound from across the large room near the boilers. I walked over to check it out, and as I approached, I could see the all-familiar sheen of pooled water around the floor drain closest to the boilers. As I got closer, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The source of the wet slapping sound was a thin gray tendril protruding from the drain, about eight inches long. It seemed to be flipping around, slapping the floor surrounding the drain. My heart started racing as I gawked at what quite clearly seemed to be a limb of something alive inside a mechanical room floor drain. I reached for a nearby broom and swatted at it, but it just started slapping around more eagerly, as if excited by the new stimulus. Beginning to panic, I did the first thing that I thought of and ran over to the boiler's blowdown valve, used for bleeding off 190 degree boiling water into the drain, which was currently home to the curious gray nuisance. I opened the valve just a bit, and the chemically treated scalding hot water had the desired effect. The sound that followed was unmistakable. 
It is the same wounded screech that I had heard the night before, only much closer and much louder. The strip of flesh began to bubble and blister before retracting as fast as slippery gray lightning back down into the drain. The pool of boiler water, mixed with the water that had been there before, disappeared into the drain with a whoosh. I closed the boiler valve and tried to compose myself. Overtiredness was the obvious cause of this impossible hallucination, I told myself. The amount of sleep I was getting each night just wasn't enough for a human to operate properly on. Disbelief set in, and I started to wonder if I had dozed off at the bench in the boiler room and dreamt the whole thing. But there was no mistaking the smell, the awful, putrid smell that now hung in the air. It was nearing the end of my shift, so I made all of my usual equipment checks and retreated to the control room, which had absolutely, positively no floor drains. A very desirable quality for me at that moment. I added my notes to the logbook, making no mention whatsoever of the particular events that would have been considered completely insane by the engineers that would come in to relieve me. Another restless day in bed. Very little sleep. I couldn't get the vision of the scalded tentacle and the sound of the horrible scream out of my mind. The alarm buzzer was silenced instantly by my hovering hand that had already been held above the alarm clock waiting for the number to change. By that time, my eyes felt puffy and irritated. My skin was crawling, and even the slightest sound seemed deafening. Anybody that has experienced long stretches with little sleep would recognize the symptoms. Severe, honest-to-God sleep deprivation was setting in. I was going to shower, but took one look at the drain in the tub and thought better of it. I splashed some cold water on my face, pulled on some clothes that seemed relatively clean, and headed out to work. When I arrived, the logbook detailed a busy day that had been plagued with complaints of slow-draining sinks and gurgling toilets that wouldn't clear completely when flushed. My nightly rounds eventually brought me into the boiler room, where I saw not one but three tendrils of at least two feet in length slapping and probing around the boiler drain that was once again very badly clogged with a large pool of water around it. Without a moment of hesitation, I went to the shop and retrieved the foot pedal operated drain snake once again, only this time I switched the auger tip out for a heavy-duty cutting head guaranteed to rip through and clear any blockage when other attachments won't get the job done. When I returned to the boiler room, I plugged in and readied the snake close to the boilers, but not close enough to be within reach of the hideous gray tentacles. I cracked the boiler drain valve slightly as I had the night before, releasing a bit more of the blistering hot water down into the drain. This caused the creature in the drain to screech and retreat partially back down into the drain. Acting as fast as I could, I immediately fed the snake forcefully down the drain several feet, pushing the tendrils further down and causing another loud cry of pain. The creature let out a different, angrier roar now, and tendrils shot up and out in spite of the thick metal coil that I was hand-feeding hard into what I assumed was the creature's body. I was beginning to reach for the footswitch, but the tentacles started weaving feverishly, and then they began wrapping themselves up and around the heavy metal snake. Before I could even process what was happening, one had started wrapping itself around my wrist. I recoiled quickly and managed to pull my left hand free, but in the next instant, two more thick tendrils had started slithering their way around my right wrist and then up my entire arm. Panicked, I tried to pull and rip at the thick, slimy bonds with my left hand, but more tentacles emerged from the drain to wrap that hand as well. They were moving too fast for me to contend with, and I quickly found myself overpowered. Nothing that had happened up until that point compared to the terror and despair that I felt next. Unable to free myself, I felt that, 
slowly but surely, I was being pulled toward the drain. There was nothing that I could do, and my hands had become useless in the tangle of grey whips. Head first, I was sliding inch by horrifying inch closer to the four-inch drain opening that this creature intended to somehow squeeze me through. In a moment of complete and utter dumb luck, I saw that my foot was very close to the pedal switch that would engage the snake motor. With every last bit of my remaining strength, I pulled back hard against the creature enough to swing my leg over and just barely catch the switch with the very tip of my toe. The result was immediate and very effective. The motor whirred to life and some of the tendrils released at once, flailing frantically around the drain. Others got bound up around the now spinning snake and were ripped apart from the sheer force. The pool of water around the drain began to change color to first a light pink and then a deep, thick crimson. The snake's cutting blades continued to tear through the soft flesh of the unseen creature with the steady rhythmic churning that only a strong electric motor can provide. The tendrils moved wildly at first, then more slowly. Finally, to my great relief, they stopped moving altogether. I took my foot off the switch and became aware of a very welcomed relative silence in the boiler room. Another moment later, the gray appendages receded completely into the drain and the pooled blood and water went down with them, bubbling and gurgling as it slowly disappeared into the darkness. After taking a moment to collect myself, I made my decision to leave the building right then and there. I left everything just as it was. When the day shift arrived, they'd inexplicably find a hundred feet of bloody snakes stuck in a drain pipe in the boiler room, and that was perfectly fine by me. If I had tried to explain, they would never have believed me anyway. I'm not sure how many days it has been, but I do know that I still haven't slept. Since then, I spend most of my time in my bedroom, far from most of my house's indoor plumbing. There's a bucket that I have close by for when nature calls. Every time I feel as though I'm about to drift off to sleep, I hear the soft, wet slapping that I heard that first night when I saw the tentacle. Every time I get up out of bed to check the kitchen and bathroom, however, the sound stops, and I don't find anything there. I hope you enjoyed The Problem with the Drains, as written by Chris Mueller and performed by Eric Peabody. Thank you for listening and for joining us tonight for this episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. As a reminder, take a moment and stop by our iTunes page and leave us a five-star review and a kind word, and to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and it has been a pleasure. Don't forget, you can find more of me and 30-plus episodes of additional terrifying tales at the Horror Hill Podcast, available wherever podcasts can be found, or at simplyscarypodcast.com. Be sure to subscribe to make sure you never miss a new release. Thanks for your support. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. <laughs> Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, a production of Chilling Entertainment, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. 
Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted by yours truly, Steve Taylor. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Logo by Craig Groshek. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? We take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to us. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew each and every week. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. We'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.